My name is Gus Ariola. I was born in Florence, Arizona, and uh, went to the year 1917 uh, from a, to a family of nine children, six uh, brothers and two sisters, five brothers and two sisters. And uh, we uh, came to Los Angeles when I was eight years old, settled there, and during the Depression years, I went to uh, graduate from high school right into the animation business in 1936. Uh, I spent uh, one year at uh, Columbia Pictures animating Crazy Cat cartoons. A year later, I was told that MGM was starting a cartoon department, so we went over to MGM in 1937. In 39, I met this young lady next to me, Mary Frances Sevier, who was in the painting and inking department. And by that time, I had worked myself up to the story department at MGM, working with Bill Hanna and Joe Barbera, later to be known as Hanna Barbera, on the Cat and Mouse uh, series, Tom and Jerry. I worked there until uh, 1941 when I had this idea for a comic strip due to the fact that I had been asked to design some Mexican bandits for a cartoon at MGM. And in uh, working for designing these bandits, I played along with this fat. You must remember that um, everything was stereotypical in those early days in Hollywood. All bandits were Mexican or Orientals. And so I fell into that stereotyping, unfortunately, and designed this big fat Mexican. I cleaned him up a little bit, renamed him Gordo, and used him as a comic strip. I sold the comic strip in 1941. Luckily, uh, because Mary Frances was still working at the studio, she overheard that my former director boss there, Rudy Ising, was going to be given a commission in the Army as a major to start a training film unit. I uh, was a due to be drafted, I was 1A, and the strip was j merely about Ten months old at the time, when Pearl Harbor happened, and I went to see Major Izing. He wasn't a major yet, but I went to see him, and he said, "Go ahead and enlist. Don't wait to be drafted." Well, it, did, it took a certain amount of something bravery, I guess, to go and enlist, but I did. I enlisted, and luckily, I was ordered back to Culver City. To be a member, to be uh, in the um, first motion picture unit of the Army Air Force, General um, Hab Arnold wanted his own uh, training film unit. He had been using established studios in Hollywood, Warner Brothers, MGM, all of them. He'd been using their directors and their writers and their actors to make training films, and he wanted his own in the Army. So he created this unit. And all the more or less famous animators and writers in the industry ended up at Culver City at Hal Roach Studios. Frank Thomas, one of the famous Disney cartoonists, was in our unit, as were many other well-known artists. And that was the war years. And during the war years, I received uh, special permission from S special services in Washington to continue the strip as a Sunday feature. I was privileged to do that. It kept my hand in the business and uh, was able to keep Gordo's name before the public, even though we only had about 12 papers. They were in places like San Francisco, Texas, New York, so that Gordo did have an audience during the war. We lived in Culver City until after the war. We moved to La Jolla for three years. I resumed doing the, da the daily strip, working by myself with her help. Since she had been in the industry, I used to bounce material off her. It's a lonely business trying to write and draw a comic strip by yourself. So I would come down every morning and say, I've got this situation here. What what will I do with it? And very often, she and my son would come up with the answer to something that I had been groping for all morning. Uh, Let's see, where are we now? We're... Well, all of a sudden we had a son. 
Well, in 1946, we had a son, Carlin. Uh, he's gone now, but he was very helpful to me all during his teenage years. Uh, I got a lot of material for the strip from him, from both of them. I'd come down to breakfast, and we'd have a gag session. In the, in the animation business, I worked with a bunch of writers, and it was the way we worked was sit around the table and bounce things off each other. Well, I missed that when I left the studio, so I used my family. Anyhow, we, we lived in, uh, in La Jolla for three years, and uh, we moved to Phoenix, Arizona, because our son was having trouble with the weather in La Jolla was unusually cold for three years. And the doctor said, well, why don't you go inland? Maybe it'll help. Well, inland, he meant Chula Vista or someplace near San Diego. We went all the way back to Arizona. I was interested in going back anyway to, to see whether it, we would like living there again. And uh, we lived in Phoenix for five years. They were very instructive five years. We didn't like the weather. We would leave every summer and come over here anyway. But while we were in Phoenix, we met very important and unusual people that we are, that really influenced and helped my work a lot. One of them, of course, was Mr. Frank Lloyd Wright, who we were asked to his house to dinner one night, and that proved to be an adventure. She sat at his feet. He liked pretty girls, by the way. And, uh, but we met a lot of the architects and a lot of people that we're, we're, we still are in touch with in Arizona. But because of the weather, we decided we wanted to come back to California. So in 1956, we ended up in Carmel. How did we do that? While we were in Arizona, we met Donald Teague, famous painter, and watercolorist, magazine illustrator. And he told us right out that we should be living in Carmel. Well, having been ready to leave Arizona anyway, we did. We came here, and all we had to do was take a look at the place and realize this is where we wanted to be. So from 1956 until now, this is where we made our home. I worked until 15 years ago, always working at studios at home. And uh, you tell about the first time we came here. To, it was uh, 4th of July. Oh, I, I think our introduction to Carmel was the, the 4th of July picnic on the beach. And in those days, Everyone went to the picnic. I don't think anyone was left at home that night. And it was amazing how many people we met that night were still our friends, and we still speak to them on the street, and we know that this is when we met. We've, we've lost a lot it, of them. We've lost but a I must say, a lot, a lot of them are gone. Will but Shaw, the architect, he took us around that night and introduce it to everybody up and down the beach. And uh, they were names that you, you would know if we could remember them now, but also Will knew that we were looking for a place to live, and he picked us up one time at a house we were renting on the point, Art Strasberger's house. <clears throat> he took me to the, he took both of us to the lab. It happened to be a Wednesday night when everybody, that was... This was an afternoon that oh, that me. I didn't go on Wednesday night. But it was a Wednesday, because that's what the, that's why all the people were there. Anyway, he took us to the lab, and we met Harlan Watkins and Ed Larsh and... Joe Turner. Joe, Dr. Joe Turner, all famous names in the peninsula. And we were just absolutely amazed at what went on at that lab that afternoon. We couldn't get over the... Uh, the dial, the conversation, the jokes, the the general atmosphere of the place, we were most impressed. And uh, it wasn't until about a year after that that I was asked to join the lab. And but we worked here, as I say, and met people, uh, Big Sur people, Henry Miller. We were at a party one night, and I didn't know who Henry Miller was. I hadn't read him. But my friends told me the next day they saw a picture of us in the paper, said, you know Henry Miller? And I said, well, I do now. <laughs> and, uh, oh, I can't think of all the people that... Oh, well, no, after all, we've been here for 
43 years and we have met lots of people. Still, still no, the ones were alive. Well, I was asked to join by Harlan Watkins. He came over to see me. I was working in the studio and he said that uh, the fellows at the lab would like to have me as a member. This was in 1957. We'd been here a year and uh, after all, Eldon Dadini and uh, Hank Ketchum were members and we were, had been friends for years. We first came to the peninsula, as I, and left thinking back now, in 1953. We were living in Arizona and the Monterey County Fair had a Mexican or Spanish or Latin theme that year and they asked me to do some advertising for them using Gordo. I did and uh, they invited us to come to the fair in 1953. We came, that's when I first met Eldon. I had known Hank earlier, I had met him in Arizona. And we were Jimmy Hatlow, Eldon and Hank and I, and I forget some other cartoonists, <laughs> were to be judges at a beauty contest at the uh, theater in Monterey in connection with the fair that year. Well, we met beforehand at Gallatin's and had many, many drink. <laughs> and we were in fine shape to judge a beauty contest, I must say, because I think we picked the poor, most ungainly one, didn't we? Well, they all were. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, yeah, it was hard to pick them. It was a, the saddest beauty contest. <laughs> it really was. And, and he said, I'm never going to judge another beauty contest. But I forget how we finally came to a decision, but I think Jimmy Hadler finally said that one, and we, we all agreed. But that was our first visit to uh, Carmel. We didn't see them again until 56 when we moved here. Uh, I was privileged and, and uh, lucky to have met and known uh, Ted Durine at the newspaper because Ted was one of the editors who really liked Gordo and always championed it and saw to it that it had held its place in the, on the comic page. He moved it up to right underneath Peanuts and that's where we stayed for many years. And of course, I remember talking to Colonel Griffin and uh, admired the paper in those days. Everybody loved the, the Peninsula Herald. But um, the comic strip business, uh, is, it's, a, it's a dying art. There aren't as many newspapers as there used to be. and. Uh, I felt that I, I left it right at the right time. Uh, I, I retired after 44 years of actually doing the strip and five years of in the animation business, so that was 50 years that I was on the board, bent over a board drawing. But, uh, the area wasn't completely uh, unusual. My grandmother was born in uh, Watsonville, and uh, as a young lady, she married at very early age, 15 or 16, and w they left Watsonville for Arizona, and my mother was born in Lone Pine on the way to Arizona. So I felt I was coming home when I came to Carmel. <laughs> my brother tried to trace the name back. He went as far back as Cuba. Some conquistador came to, to Cuba and then on up the coast. My father was from Hermosillo, Sonora, Mexico. He came to Arizona early in, uh, I mean, late in the 1800s. Uh, he was a merchant. He had a general merchandise store in, in Florence, which was a great treat to me as a young boy. I loved hanging around that store. Uh, but he lost his eyesight, was losing his eyesight, and the rest of the boys in the family didn't want to be in the business. So we all came to California in 1925, and my different brothers went into different businesses. We had a banker and a, uh, and a uh, designer of swimming suits. Uh, Cola, California was another brother. Another brother was a buyer for, for a May company, and I was the only one in the family who actually got into an artistic line. I don't know where it came from. Well, you were much younger than the rest of your family. He's you, the youngest you, one. 
You said you said that uh, you went from high school. How? When? When was the deciding factor about uh, about uh, cartooning for you? you well, know, I in start? in high school I took a lot of art less arts courses, and knew that uh, I wanted to do something with my art, but I didn't know what. And in 1935, when I graduated from high school, I was lucky that it, that was during the time that Disney was really combing the country for artists. And uh, I didn't go to Disney. Instead, I went to Columbia Pictures, who was, uh, it was called Screen Gems. And I happened to know somebody there, so I went and applied there, and I, did, I showed them the samples. The samples were just drawings of Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, and setups like that. And they liked the samples, so they hired me as an in-betweener. Uh, an in-betweener is the one that put, draws, the, that makes the drawings between the animator's drawings to make the drawings flow. Well, you have to have a certain amount of talent to m mimic the animator's drawings from one to the other. And luckily, I was talented enough to do that. I didn't mind being uh, an uh, in-betweener, but then the next step up was assistant animator who cleaned up the animator's rough drawings. I liked that better, but I really all this time wanted to write material for the cartoons rather than get into the animation. Animation is, is, a, is a science, it's an exact science. It has to do with timing, and it's a little bit mathematical, which I wasn't interested in. So, after submitting some ideas and getting moved up to the art department, up to the story department, that's when the whole focus of my art changed. I decided I wanted to tell my own stories and draw my own pictures, and that's, that's what led to Gordo. Well, we knew quite a few members in the Art Association, and they did not have any lowly cartoonists at that time as members, as uh, working members. Les Emery, a famous painter here in town and a close friend of ours, thought that I should be a member. And I don't know how they... Well, when, when we were first here, you were made an associate well, member. Well, we were associate members, right. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we... Murray, uh, I think, and, uh, said that, um, well, there was something said about we were all associate members when you were... Yes, like but, but not, wor not uh, working members. Anyhow, Les Emery, one year, was president of it, and he said, Gus Ariola's a member. That's it. And that was it. Uh, in, other, in other times, we would have to qualify. You'd have to uh, show them uh, paintings and, uh, and be voted in. But when Les <laughs> was president, I was in. That was <laughs> all there was to it. And I've been in ever since, and it's been some 40 years, like 35 years. But I sell originals through the Art Association. Uh, people from um, Texas just bought a Sunday page and he saw my name in some magazine somewhere saying that I showed and sold through the Art Association and he called him up from Dallas, Texas just on the basis of having read it in the magazine and uh, little things like that don't hurt at all that kind of publicity to have somebody call from Texas and say, I want Gus Ariola's original. So I've been selling there now for the last 15, 20 years. Uh, name at birth and then... Uh, Mary Frances Severe. And I was born in Deming, New Mexico. And um, in 1914. And I lived with my... Uh, severe grandparents and with them, with my mother and father, we moved, um, where did we move first? We, we moved <laughs> a lot. And she said, this, this, this friend brought me some paints and some cells and she said, you can paint this, you can do this, and when you can learn to do this, then we can give you a job at harmonizing. Harmonizing was a studio in, in Los Angeles made up of the names of Rudy Ising and Hugh Harmon. Hugh Harmon and Rudy Ising came with Disney from Kansas City all at the, the same time in, in the early 20s. 
So that's uh, harmonizing is. And you Rudy Ising is the one, the Major Ising, who gave him his job in the army. In the yeah. army. But you were working at harmonizing. I was working at harmonizing. And uh, when I went to work at Harmonizing, that was when Disney needed help to finish Snow White. And so my first job actually was on Snow White. He uh, farmed the work out to other studios in order to get it. He, he was in trouble with that picture and the banks had lent him all the money he needed, but he was up against it. He had to finish it at a certain time. So that's why he farmed out his painting well, and we had it uh, wasn't so much farming out because we had to go over to his studio to work and that was from uh, seven in the morning until eleven at night and Sundays <laughs> weekends and so we um, my first job was was pretty hard yeah I was painting at the time just just painting mm -hmm. and um, I did that for for some time and then um, she when we were finished at, at Disney's, we went back to harmonizing and finished some more um, Disney uh, short subjects while they were starting the MGM studio over on the MGM lot. And uh, the uh, fellows from upstairs had all gone over there and just the girls were downstairs finishing the, uh, this work. It's kind of chauvinistic that the women did all the... They didn't allow women upstairs in those Not days. only that, men didn't paint an ink, just the girls painted an ink. And women did not animate <laughs> well. Some that, of that changed, <laughs> but after I was out of there. How did you and you and Gus meet? Ha! Huh. Now we're getting to the fun part. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had a Christmas party. Yeah, it was a Christmas party. MGM, the MGM cartoon department was, this was in 1939. Uh, the main lot, Mr. Louis B. Mayer used to really treat the cartoon department well. Well, he thought we were all one big family. One big family. He would send over all kinds of food, all kinds of liquor, everything we needed. And it was a really wonderful Christmas party. And uh, I had had my eye on her for a few weeks anyway. We were on we were on the second lot, the main lot, and we were on lot two, where all the great sets were. There were sets of China and the brownstone houses in New York. Anything you wanted was on that lot, and we used to walk around at lunch, and get into places where we didn't belong really. But we poked around, and I had watched her walk around the, the sets. So because when I the, got onto every set, I saw everything that was going on. Yeah, you also bumped into a Greta Garbo set when you weren't supposed to be there. I know, but she let me stay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, that Christmas party, I finally maneuvered her under the mistletoe, and I guess we kissed. You bet. And then, <laughs> and, yes. that, and then, and then we. And you turned around, and walked away, and I said. Well, I was, was I didn't want to faint in front of you. <laughs> Anyhow, that was the beginning, and we... Well, of course, too, that was the day they, um, um, for entertainment for the girls, the fellows showed the, the movie that you had been making. One of the animators made a 16 millimeter movie called Rats and Spats, and it was a takeoff on the gangster movies, and I was a gangster was the head rat. with a <laughs> scar on my face, and f part of the entertainment that Christmas party was we showed that film and it didn't have any sound but I was up in the projection room with a microphone mouthing sounds to the myself and another friend and, we were, and moving he was pretending to be an airplane he was doing all sorts and I, I spent more time looking up there at that projection booth and I said who is that <laughs> what is he doing well, that, that was the only kind of was, sound. The one that came over and kissed me, and then I, I, uh, I took notice. He said he had been watching me, but after that, I watched him. <laughs> anyway, our first date was to go see Gone with the Wind. Wasn't that it? Oh well, yes, that was, it was. Uh, that was uh, later on. What a what a line he had. He was going to star me in Gone with the Wind. His a, a parody. And so, of course, he invited me up onto the roof of the uh, uh, the studio, where he had all kinds of lights and a camera. And he was well, you were, were you were testing. We were testing you. <laughs> testing. 
And then he started drawing pictures of me and clothes. Well, I really, we really were going to make a parody of it because we had just finished Rats and Spats and we were going to do this, but... And I was going to be Scarlet. We yeah. never got around to we it. We didn't do that. So anyway, that let us start. We can't keep, keep this up. <laughs> Well, you were chased by the Marx Brothers because you poked your head under a set. You yes, were yes. For a night scene, in those days, they used to put a tarpaulin over the whole set and sandbags around the bottom of it. Well, she moved the sandbag and looked under there, and it was break time, it was lunch time, and the Marx Brothers were playing cards. And they looked down there and saw that and saw her, and they acted just like the way they would. They got they up chased and chased her out. <laughs> Well, we used to hang around in the Penthe all the time with the facets. We watched all the kids grow up down uh, there and watched them. Well, we've you see a well, lot in the In the summertime, we used to go down there at least once or twice, once or twice a week. Uh, the, Les Emery, Les and Leora Emery were great devotees of the uh, the Penthe, and she would call up and would down with me. If you started your dinner, we'll put it in the refrigerator. Yeah. Let's go to Nepenthe. And we would see different people that we knew all the time down there. It was in the late 50s and early 60s, it was family. Everybody was, we all knew each other and uh, saw Everybody each other. Would dance, and they were doing Greek dances, and all the people who run it now were little kids then, and they were dancing. Oh, that was school. Holly, did you yeah. know? Oh, well. Well, we, we knew Lolly, we knew and, Lolly really well. and all the kids, and uh, what was oh, the one? Bill, and, Bill. and, yeah, um, the well, one that went to. Well, Kate, we really Kate, didn't yes. know him, but we would see him when he would come back. Well, he had, knew us when he, he came back, yeah. He would dance. They were, they were so pretty. No, we. It was just uh, really a great place to go. Did you ever work on any of the other. Uh, publications on the peninsula like uh, a Game and Gossip or, or, or the, uh, uh, the Pinecone and that sort of thing? I never contributed anything to the Pinecone is exactly, but uh, Lee Harbick used to... Well, we it, were often pictured and written about in Game and Gossip, mm -hmm. yes, we were always in there. We had a shop. We There was a time there when we thought we were going to be able to turn our interest in Mexican things into a commercial use. So she opened a Mexican shop in 1950, 1961. She, we met a friend who was a designer and had lived in Mexico for many years and knew sources. So we opened up Gus Ariola Imports in the Dowd Arcade upstairs. Jimmy Dowd kind of <laughs> felt sorry for us. He <laughs> practically gave us that place upstairs with a very low rent. And uh, we, w she and this friend, uh, Colleen Creeden, went to Mexico and uh, made arrangements to have things manufactured on their blouses and things like that. So we had this wonderful shop I think it was a museum because we oh, realized we weren't nice merchants. We weren't merchants. We didn't like meeting the public. Mm. The public in those days was mostly hippie well, kids. Well, that is what happened after uh, for the first year or so. Everything was very pretty and and uh, it's the way I wanted it. But um, uh, I found out we didn't do anything right. The, the clothes were beautiful, but they were one of a kind. But you can't sell clothes like that because everyone's not the same size. And most of the clothes fit me, and they didn't fit anyone else. But... Uh, we, we were interested in the folk art, mainly. Yes, I wanted it to be folk art, but we found out we had to do other... I, well, I sold yardage. I had beautiful hand-loomed fabrics. And, and uh, it, it was kind of a nice thing to do, but... Um, but we were babes in the woods when it came to getting things across the border. And we, we couldn't do it. We didn't know how to get them past customs. We didn't realize you had to do a little bribery, a little more the Later there. on, it, people were able to do that, but not when we were trying to do it. And they ruined more beautiful things we had just by stamping things all over them. They would put Made in Mexico on, on folk art's eyes, you know. Eyes, you know trying to it was terrible what they did to us. Um, 
Well, there was, um, well, Fred Klepik, of course, had the, it, it was his, his arcade. And, uh, he and August Nieto were partners in running the craft center. Yeah. And and so um, Fred had the um, uh, art, supply art supply and framing. And so a um, lot of the uh, the artists we met in that way too, because they all came. We would sit in the um, uh, around the fireplace early in the morning, and then then different ones would come in for coffee, you know, and so we... We met a lot of the artists at those morning coffees. Yeah, I should say. And well, the Emery's always came for coffee, and then Fred would come out, and then anyone... And John Morris used to, Jack Morris used to come every morning. Yeah. And um, you said that the different shops that were in there, well, a uh, guy uh, had a leather shop, and uh, we still know Skye, she lives up in... Um, near Eureka now, but uh, she was, um, well, the kids liked to, to go into that leather shop, and our, our son and, was crazy about Sky. And what was the name of the one that did the tile work? Oh, oh Erica Frank. Erica Frank, who you designed know, she the, did the uh, she had a, a little shop in there. But she did all the, the Christmas angels for, for Monterey. Mm -hmm. Well, Erica had, had a shop. Her mother sat in there in that shop for years. Remo Scardigli, who used to do jewelry. And, yeah. um, the Herald used to do an art uh, uh, edition each, each year. And I have well, about 11 years of those back in the, the mm. 60s. And, mm. and to look in there, then you see Eve Bell, and you see all the people that were uh, Gus Valletri. And uh, John, John Calder. Calder did the glass blower. Not the John Calder, but John. No. <laughs> <laughs> John Calder, glass blower. Um, probably need to mention Paulinus since we're going to interview him. Paulinus? The restaurant that was there oh, yeah. for so many years. The restaurant? Paulina. Oh, um, yes. Um, um, uh, Paulina and the little uh, Maria, little tiny thing, would go out and wipe the tables. You know, the, those little kids were working it all the time. Um, Two people who, uh, whose name comes come up from time to time and we don't have a, a lot of information on, we're trying to get as much information as possible. One is, is uh, well, Vic and Bessie Knight. Do you um, remember them? Can you oh, they, yes. Indeed. Yes. Any uh, recollections of them? Well, that was another thing well, they that... they were wonderful. We would go to lunch there and Harlan Watkins used to hold forth. He being at, 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 what? at, at rings, rings, at Rings, yeah, they had a big uh -huh. table in the middle. A lot of the teachers from uh, Monterey used to come down there. Ed Larsh and, Har and Harlan were English teachers, and Harlan sort of acted like a host. I remember the first time I went there, he stood up and he said, I want to introduce Gus Ariola, and he this and that and that, and he introduced me to everybody in the, in the patio there. And Vic, of course, was... Uh, a uh, good friend of ours. We used to visit with him and Bessie. I wish uh, we had some of those little funny newspapers. That yeah, he used to put out a little out. little he was paper. So funny. But uh, no, I, we used to go and, and eat lunch, and he'd come over and sit with us, and we would discuss not only comics but whatever was the topic was that day. Uh, no, I, we really used to hang around rings quite often. I did, not you, but. I used to go pretty often. Well, we spent a great deal of time at Jean Arthur's because she wanted to play. Well, we, the people, we met her through the Emery's, Les and Leora Emery, and there was a group that I dubbed the Carmel Point Rat Pack because we all seemed to get together the Van Loban cells, the Emery's, and, Jean, and, Jean and, and Ellen Jean and, and, Jean and Ellen and ourselves, yeah. And uh, Jean was, she was a movie star, and she never forgot it. And I used to call her my green goddess, uh, my screen goddess. And uh, she, uh, she wanted to do something, but it was, you know, she never did. At a party, she, she wanted to, us to all act out something. Always. Tell a story, let's do something. And everybody would, all they wanted to do was drink and have fun. They didn't want to. Didn't want to play act, but well, the first time she met you, she <laughs> nearly had a fit. She 
followed him around. Well, I don't know, Gus was acting out. No, we were playing charades, and I was acting out. I was a salmon going upstream or something. <laughs> but you were dancing around the room, <laughs> and so she started I did a lot of out. dumb things when I was younger. But she followed you around that night, and everything you did, she was going to do too. And then she'd say, who is he? <laughs> she didn't know who you were, and finally, good heavens, she found out all right. Well, we got to be good friends, and when she went to Vassar to teach, she would call up and tell her good friend Ellen to open up the house and have the areolas and the emery's over, it just happened to have a party. And we and would. She, and she'd call us during the party and talk to us all. Yeah. And when she was in Hollywood doing that, um, her TV series. TV series, she would call. And then she brought her clothes home one time from that TV series and wanted me to wear them. So I was. I dress, but she was difficult too. But, um, what was her TV series? She was a, a lady lawyer. And uh, I think they only did about six of them. Not very many, but. Um, uh, she did, did an entrance each time and in some fabulous outfit. And uh, then she would call me and tell me what she'd been wearing. And she said, I'll bring it next time I come up. And uh, one time I know she had this black lace gown and she was sitting on a merry-go-round horse. And um, so she brought that dress for me to put on. Well, I put it on, but... She never forgot. That then she got mad at me. She thought she was Peter Pan. You yeah, know, she, she had, always thought she was Peter Pan. And she always wanted to, well, she would take out her, her scrapbook and show us pictures of her as Peter Pan. And she just, uh, she was fun to be around up to a point. Oh, I know. Yeah, <laughs> well, the weather brought me here. I mean, it was good weather. Well, we've been in Phoenix. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, not only the weather, but the proximity to Phoenix, I mean to uh, San, Francisco. San Francisco. We it's, thought we wanted to be in San Francisco. We used to go to the city very often, and not so much anymore, but uh, being close to San Francisco, and it's a beautiful area, and the people, the interesting people. I know we're forgetting some people, but we... Oh, we're forgetting a lot. We've known everybody around. But when we lived in La Jolla, our son was just about, what, two and three. And so I, it was kind of disturbing for me to work at home. So I rented, mm -hmm. I rented a little studio in La Jolla right across the street from the post office. <laughs> and I was still late. I, was, <laughs> I would still run across right before it closed. He said he would run across with the ink still wet. <laughs> How about Frank O'Neill? I'm sure you were friends with Frank. Frank O'Neill, yes. Yes, Maybe well, did. Frank came to me. When he, before he started his strip, and we talked about what he wanted to do, and I helped him with the, the fact that I said, well, why don't you do this, because then you can, you can't, you won't limit yourself to any one idea, you can do whatever you want to. And he came up with the name of Short Ribs, which I thought was a great name for a, a strip about anything. And he was very successful with it, he sold it and did very well with it, and for quite a while. But he was, he was an individual that um, unfortunately... Well, he drank. Really. Yeah, I was trying to put it in a nice way. No, there's no other way with Frank O'Neill. It's, <laughs> it's too he bad. Just, he really blew it yeah. because he just let it drop. His assistant, uh, uh, Frank Hill, um, carried it for a while. The syndicate hired him to do it after Frank dropped it. And so he did short ribs for a while. Well, that was just a gimmick, sort of left over from the early animation days. But uh, you go, you grow out of different characters. You use them for a while, and then you you go on to something else. And I used that little boy for oh, at least f maybe eight years or so. And then he just faded out. The other character, where I made my mistake, I guess, was in having the Pepito grow up. Uh, and so a lot of those early characters, I couldn't have them grow up. It was a matter of material. I, I didn't need them anymore. Well, he was taking a lot of science at, at school, and he'd bring it home, and I would use it. I'd, have, I'd use it in the strip. Really, really, yeah. And then when he got mixed up with a rock band, I did that too. I had uh, Pepito had a rock band, and the clothes and everything. Um, and then when he 
he grew up and went away and then Yeah, he went to college and we lost him due to injuries to, from an automobile accident in 1980. He was 34 years old. But uh, no, he was a great source of inspiration and material. We do have a granddaughter. Yeah. And she uh, graduated from uh, Rochester University in New York just this month, this last month. Last month. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's in New York now looking for a job. <laughs> she was interested in museum work. She did some museum work, but she surprised us by telling us that she's a master electrician. She's <laughs> stage, lighting. She stage lighting. We didn't know this. So she says, I can always get work yeah, <laughs> as an electrician. So we'll see. Yeah. This group here is the... Uh, the lab group. The lab group. Mm -hmm. Can you give us the names of them all? Frank Wright, Jack Morris is gone, Ed Haber, Bruce Harris who's gone, that is uh, Hank Ketchum, Eldon Dadini, Dr. Stotler who's gone, Joe, uh, Al Parker who's gone, myself, Joe Turner we've lost, uh, Dr. Hooker, uh, Bob Tuttle, Bill Stewart, James Nebel, Sam Karras, El Judge El Dick Eldred, Bob Fall, and uh, Morgan Stock, Will Shaw, and uh, Stewart. Uh, Walt, not Walt. Bill Stewart. Bi Walt Stewart. This is Bill Stewart. Bill. Stewart.